Hello members, welcome and good evening one and all. Lovely to see you tonight. It's been a few weeks since we had a sip size session, so I'm really, really excited to be back with them. For those of you I've never met before, my name is Anna Spooner and I think there are a few newbies joining us today, hopefully some Italian wine fans. Uh, so welcome everybody. I'm Anna Spooner, like I said, part of the tastings and events team at the Wine Society and joined this evening behind the scenes by Mahesh. So Mahesh is going to be handling all things technical. Um, and if you've got any questions, please pop them in the Q&A. Mahesh is going to be managing uh, managing those. And then in the chat, fingers crossed, we've got it working again. Uh, hopefully someone will pop some nice something nice in the chat to double check that it's working. We have had some strange fun things going on with the chat the last couple of weeks. But do let us know where you are and what you're drinking. Tim Jones, thank you from the humid from humid Hoy Lake. Um, welcome, Tim. Yeah, do let us know where you are, what you're drinking. If you're tasting along tonight as well, just let us know what you think of the wines. We'd love to hear about them. Um, I've got all three this evening. If you're not tasting along, please don't worry. The sip size sessions are designed to give you a little bit of information, um, but in an informal, chatty way. So I will be talking through the three wines, but just using them to tell a little bit of a story of the region of Tuscany in central Italy. So um, when you are using the chat, one final thing Mahesh always likes me to say, please hit everyone before you uh, write into uh, where you are, what you're drinking, what you're thinking of wines, whatever it may be, holiday recommendations, who knows. But make sure that you do select everyone. It defaults to hosts and panellists. And if you hit that, then only Mahesh and I will see it. So we'll get some great holiday recommendations, but no one else will. Uh, so, yes, please, please, please do that. Uh, there will be a bit of a presentation this evening. <clears throat> As always, I'm happy to send that round afterwards, too, along with the recording. So when I send the link to the YouTube recording tomorrow, please let me know if you'd like a copy of the slides. I'd be more, more, more than happy to share them um, because... It's not a complicated region per se, Tuscany, but there are some interesting, um, some interesting rules, some regs, uh, some legal definitions that we'll go through. And I'm going to do an overview of Tuscany tonight. So there's a bit more nitty gritty detail on some of the maps that hopefully you can uh, you can enjoy. So let's begin. Let's have a quick look. Um, yes, let's begin with an overview. I think that's the best part um, to start with Tuscany. We're going to do an overview, a bit of a history, and then we are going to go into Chianti being the most famous part of Tuscany, and then we'll move on to some other regions as well. Um, I don't want to focus too much on Chianti tonight. I think we've probably got a big juicy Chianti event in us for a focus on later down the line but I'm going to take a big bite out of Chianti um, so we'll do as much as we can in the time that we've got. Uh, so a bit about Tuscany it's the third highest volume of DOC and DOCG wines in Italy. DOC means Denominazione di Origine Contrata um, and DOCG is the same but with Garantita at the end. And it's sort of the equivalent of the AOC Appalachian Triangle in France. So it's a regional designation. The difference here between maybe France and Italy, I would say, is that DOC is the sort of standard region. And then you've got the DOCG, which tends to be um, almost always an amped up version. So it's the third highest volume of those. There are 41 DOC, so that good level, and then uh, 11, sorry, DOCG, which is that great level um, of, of wine regional production. Um, it's only after Piemonte and Veneto. So it's only after the places that produce things like Barolo and Suave uh, and, and Prosecco. So it's, it's very high up on the quality ladder in Italy, but it's also the third most planted region after Sicily and Puglia in the south. So it's actually the third most uh, largest area of vines in Italy, but the quantity is nowhere near as high as those regions. And that's because here in Tuscany, the soils are poor. And when I say poor, I don't mean bad for grape growing. I mean, excellent for grape growing, grape growing and olive growing. Um, and the growers are really trying now to keep a cap on the yields. So even though they're the third most planted, they're actually the eighth highest in production. So you can do the maths there. 
Um, there are there are lots of people leapfrogging them with less vines, but much higher production, higher volumes. Volumes are kept low. The most famous regions, I've mentioned some of them already, but Chianti is the most famous. Um, in fact, I'm going to get you a map up because that would make a lot more sense. Uh, let's get a map up. Uh, so we've got a few regions here. We've got Kian. I've circled the ones we're going to talk about today. Uh, so we've got Chianti Rufina, which is here, our first wine. Chianti Classico, our second wine. And then we've got Brunello de Montalcino. Uh, but the yellow areas are all different uh, Chianti appellations. And I will mention some of those. We will also mention this coastal area here, which is where the Super Tuscans are from. Um, and then we, I'm going to try and make sense about the difference of the towns of Montepulciano and Montalcino. Very confusing. There are grapes with the same name as towns. Italy doesn't make life easy, but don't worry, we're going to try and unpick it as we go. Um, there's also a wine from, from Tuscany and all over Italy that I'm going to touch on, I hope, if I have time, which is Vinsanto. Uh, it's made from dried grapes and a range of the region's grapes, so we'll try and cover a bit of that too. Um, you can see from the map here, it's hugged by the coast to the west, mountains to the east, and then it's got more vineyard regions, so Emilia, Romagna, and Lazio and Umbria and Marche, so it's surrounded by vineyard regions. But I suppose what's most beautiful and incredible for, for viticulture in Tuscany are these rolling hills. Essentially from this coastal town here, the hills just roll up and continue rising higher and higher and higher. And uh, I can't remember the number, but it's some crazy number, like 68% of all of Tuscany is technically a hillside. Um, Anyone that's visited before, and I'm sure plenty of members have, will know that. And it's it's an um, adventurous place to take a walking holiday. But for viticulture, that means that the altitudes can be quite high. Winters can be quite bleak, but not, but not necessarily. Um, but the temperature and the climate is really important. It's got relatively moderate alcohol, considering its, its position latitude-wise. You know, where it is in terms of closest to the equator should potentially be warmer, but because it's got those, it varies from place to place. The coastal areas are obviously lower, but some of the really quality regions for Sangiovese, which adores the hillside and is the is the great variety that we're going to focus on today, n n not intentionally, but because it's the biggest production in Tuscany, it loves those hillsides. The hills mean that the, uh, the altitudes keep the acidity high with the high diurnal range, uh, the, the rising and, and lowering of the temperatures. Um, but also Sangiovese likes to bake in the sun, but it gives you little pockets where you can have a cooler area, a warmer, sunny area. So uh, this really is the perfect place to grow this particular grape variety. So that's the map. And we'll come back to that in a second. I'm going to brush on some history because... I think arguably more so than any other region in Italy, Tuscany is probably the, the most historic. Um, it dates, production here dates back to, they think, around 8th century BC. Uh, and certainly in 3rd century BC, there are references by Greek writers to the wines of Tuscany. So it started a long, long time ago. There is evidence of Tuscan wine production all through Roman and Middle Ages. The, if you imagine where it, it, it is, uh, Florence was the place in the epicenter of Renaissance, of the Renaissance. So you have aristocrats, merchant classes. Um, there were houses like uh, Frescobalda, Riccasoli. We talk about Riccasoli in a minute. Very famous Florentine wine merchant houses. Um, 14th century is when we finally get reference to um, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, so the noble wines of Montepulciano. Um, and strangely, the earliest Chianti references were actually to white wines. I will talk about that in a bit. It took a while for them to work out that San Giovese was the thing to plant in Chianti. Um, but there's a lot going on. Um, it wasn't until really the Napoleonic War. And there was a statesman, statesman Rico Soli, uh, that I just mentioned. And he was from Chianti Classico, where, near where wine number two is. He actually, uh, this used to be one of his outposts this particular wine, which is amazing. Um, and he visited Germany, France, studied viticulture, grapes, and he said, right, I've worked it out. The grapes we need to focus on are Sangiovese, 
Canelo and Malvesia, the white grape. Um, and he sort of produced in some ways the Tuscany that we know today. So that's history. Grapes, I'm going to rush over so that we can start drinking a Chianti. And I don't mean to rush over them. There are some lovely grapes planted. But Sangiovese, the grape dominating these three wines, is two thirds of all the plantings. It's 85% of the red wine production. Uh, the beautiful thing about the grape Sangiovese, and I will do an entirely full 45 minutes on Sangiovese, don't worry. Uh, it's a little bit like Pinot Noir in some senses. It's so um, it's so historic and old that it has has mutated. So much like Pinot has, where there's lots of clones, the same can be said for Sangiovese. Uh, that also means it's got lots of local names. So I will give you more clues about the local names as we go through. But just to throw one out here, Brunello de Montalcino actually is San. It's the equivalent of Sangiovese from the town of Montalcino, and this is 100% Sangiovese. Sangiovese. Um, so they don't make our life easy. So if in doubt, you're probably drinking something with majority Sangiovese in. There are a few regional varieties that are increasingly popular, and my pronunciation will really not do these justice, but um, Pugnitello is one of them, small scale reviving red grape variety. And um, Sileglio, li, li, yeah, Sileglio. Um, that's having a huge revival, even if I can't say it. <laughs> um, and it is, is increasingly being used in blends. There is a bit of Ugni Blanc, aka Trebbiano. They call it Trebbiano here. Um, that's the uh, most widely planted white grape, but Malvasia is also their Vermentino, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and then there's a very famous, I'll just get the map up one more time before we go to Chianti, because there is a very famous white wine. I want to mention it uh, because is this as good a map as I could get? I'm just going to go into this one here. This is our second map. Um, Bernaccia di San Gimigiano. And that is just here, this pink dot. And this is a white wine made from a grape, Vernaccia, surprise, surprise, around the area of San Gimigiano. Uh, and 1966, this was the first place in Italy to receive that DOC designation. Uh, Italy was a bit later giving their, their, their reward cards out compared to France. Um, but this wine has been made for over seven uh, centuries. And this is a um, very famous, but very small production white wine. It's very rare, hard to find on the UK market, um, but very famous, very prestigious, and certainly worth a mention, even if we haven't had opportunity to taste it today. Uh, wines are brisk, developing some nutty flavours, quite full bodied, um, but that high acidity is, is a true character and that's very classic of these central Italian white grapes anyway. We will touch on them later, but I should mention Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot and Syrah, which are also all planted around the Super Tuscan area of Bulgaria. So let's go on to Chianti, shall we? We're going to talk about Brufina first. And, uh, oh, thank you very much, Mahesh. Yeah, when we first put this together, the Venaccia de San Gimignano was, um, it hadn't arrived yet. So if you do want to try one, we have a 2020, I think. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we have got a 2021 in stock. Um, oh, somebody's tried one. Yeah, I would have done it. It just arrived a bit later than all the other wines. So we wouldn't have been able to have it in time. But if in doubt, and if you just fancy trying it, I really, really encourage you to, because it's a beautiful wine. And like I mentioned, very rare, um, but very, um, how do I describe it, historic and impressive. Uh, so certainly worth a try. Now, oh, and Mahesh says there is also a more affordable 2021. So thank you, Mahesh, for popping those in there. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to cover Rufina, then we're going to go to Chianti Classico, and then we're going to go to Brunello di Montalcino in our tasting. But we are going to cover some other regions as we go through. But I think it's time to try a wine. I hope you agree with me. Uh, we are going to try first a Chianti Rufina. And Chianti Rufina is, um, well, Chianti in general is probably the most important wine zone in the whole of Italy characterized by this lovely rooster, <laughs> which you see on all the labels. Uh, this one's got it better than the others. So this is actually the Chianti Classico rooster, I should say. 
Uh, it obviously wouldn't be on the Brunello. Um, but what you can see around these bottles instead is this is the DOCG label. So you can see that it's um, a um, denomination de origen con, uh, controlada y garantita. But the Chianti region is, is vast. It's, it's, it's Tuscany's largest classified zone. It produces 8 million cases of wine a year. And essentially the two DOCGs are split. So the first DOCG is what we're tasting, which is Chianti. And that is then split up. And I'll tell you why that's split up in a moment. But the second is Chianti Classico. And um, they have very slightly different rules. So Chianti DOCG is minimum 70% Sangiovese, whereas Chianti Classico is minimum 80%. You'll also see that there's slightly different aging requirements. So six months of aging before release on the Chianti. And then on Classico, it's 12 months of aging before release. Um, the subzones are quite interesting. The subzones are not all widely exported. Um, I actually feel like I see lots of Colistinesi, um, but maybe it's because I love saying the word. Um, but there isn't a huge amount. They've just introduced one more, which is Terra de Vita. Vinci, so um, where Leonardo da Vinci was from, Terra da Vinci. Um, and uh, yeah, the, so the main ones, I suppose, are Chianti Monte. Actually, I'll get a map up that's going to help. Um, so essentially, you have Chianti Classico, which is this red bit in the middle. We're tasting the most northerly of the um, regular Chianti subzones. So, what happened was Chianti Classico, the red bit in the middle, was doing very well, it was very popular. So being the clever people that they are, um, the Italians decided to expand the zones. But instead of just saying Chianti, which they did um, in this white region, they also said there are some special spots that make slightly different styles of wine. And these are the, the pinky bits and some of the greeny bits as well. So it looks a bit confusing. I apologize. But thank you, Quentin Sadler, for this lovely map, because it does do it nice and easily for us. Um, we're drinking Rufina, and Rufina is, um, it's one of the finest, probably, arguably the finest and the most age-worthy. When it's young, it can seem very light, Rufina, and it can seem quite tart. And one of the reasons is it's further to the north, so it's a bit cooler. It's quite protected as well from um, any sort of ocean influence so it has a higher diurnal range the temperature increases more in the day but cools at night that tends to preserve acidity um, and then also the the hillsides are, are quite um dramatic should we say so rufina is one of those wines that is a bit of a uh, you have to know it to know how good it is um the other ones that are very popular uh, there's a few as i mentioned i see quite a lot of colisensi uh, which is just down here. Um, but there are a few, Mon Montalbo, Montalbano is um, quite light as well. That one's just west of Florence. Um, there are a couple of others, Colliaratini. But really the Rufina is the one that if you're really in the know, that's the age-worthy one. Also, if you're drinking, and again, maybe this is why Colisenesi always sticks in my brain, um, but Colisenesi was the only one that was allowed to include white wines after they prohibited them in 2006. There was a huge movement to modernise uh, the, the recipe for Chianti, increase the Sangiovese and remove the white grapes that historically had been used to kind of prop up um, the wines. So in 2006, they prohibited the white wines other than Colisenesi, which had to wait until 2015. So there are some unique colisinesis still knocking around that are Chianti's with white wines blended into them, or white grapes, I should say. Um, but you will very, very rarely find that now. Um, I will, yeah, I would say that this is particularly a classic Chianti Rufina that we have here. Um, it's a particularly older state. There's evidence of um, uh, a... Etrusc Etruscan, so same time as Greek occupation, similar time to Greece, uh, as well as Roman occupation. Uh, it's now owned by a family called the Lippis, uh, by Enrico and Elisa, and they bought the estate in 1992. So, yeah, they're relatively relatively new on the scene in the grand age of the estate or, or the area, but they took a lot of time to fix it. They lowered the yields. They started handpicking the fruit. 
because this wasn't in that original designation of Chianti, where Chianti Classico sits, where the, the heartland originally was, they, you could often find that some of the Chianti outlying wines were a bit cowboy. Um, but they've really upped the quality here. So they organically farm, they green harvest, i.e. if they've got too many bunches and the wine's getting too dilute, they will actually chop bunches off and sacrifice those bunches in order to make better quality wine. Um, it's about 100 hectares, but only 15 are vines. There's olives and, and uh, agriturismo as well, so you can visit here. Uh, and as I mentioned, the Rufina sites, this one is, is a pretty normal Rufina site. So all of the vines are between 350 and 500 metres above sea level. So high altitude in the world of, of Tuscany and wine, um, but not super high and certainly very, very normal for Rufina. So it makes this sort of refined, elegant style. Uh, it's majority Sangiovese. I think it's Colorino that gets 10% in this, but you don't hold me to that. Your Canaleo, Canaleo and um, Colorino are two grapes that are often blended in. I think this is 10% Colorino. Um, it's fermented in steel and concrete and gets 50% in oak for a year before being blended back into the concrete. So it's not fully oaked. And that's quite common with, again, the Rufina style because they're trying to preserve that freshness. And actually, it helps it age in some ways as well. So I'm keen to know what you think. Having a smell, um, I'm just going to second Sarah Knowles' lovely tasting note of those sort of black cherries, violets, red currants. I think there's also something quite herbaceously green on this as well, for me personally. So I think it's, um, I get something quite leafy, quite herbal. And weirdly, I always think of Chianti Rufina as dried herbs, but they're, they're, there's a freshness in herbs here. I'm almost getting, um, I am getting that kind of licorice um, that sort of herb, as well as the dried leafy herbs that I also get. So let me know what you think if you're tasting along, members. I think for me, it's a great value wine. Um, it's more... It's more on the fresh side. It's more on the light side. It is that fruity, dark cherries. Um, yeah, very herbaceous. Mm. I really love Julia's comment there that she had a Rufina from a producer, um, Colignoli, some years ago. Um, delicious, changed my mind about Chianti, which I'd never previously got. I think a lot of people have that, Julia. Um, and you've mentioned there was a few age, few years age on it. It's no surprise for me to see that this is a £12.50 bottle. And Sarah has said that it could potentially age for another four years. I think if you spoke to Frascole, they'd say, and then some. And um, these are wines that are modest in price, but age very, very well. When we move on to the Brunello, those age even further. But really, um, really great Chianti. Ten years is is you know, is normal. That's not exceptional. That's that's what Sangiovese does best. And I think a lot of Chianti often will, will start its life at three years old, really. Um, you know, cheap and cheerful basket Chianti, I don't speak for. But um, <laughs> but certainly these, these styles of wine, you want to be waiting from now to start drinking them. Oh. And somebody has just, John's just mentioned a Rufina Reserva from 2016 that he was drinking well a few days ago. So I can absolutely believe it, John. Um, what food maps well to this wine, please, from James? Before we move on, I will just cover that because I think, um, yeah, and before anyone makes any jokes, I did see a silence, <laughs> a silence of the lamb joke. I think it's faba beans or something. <laughs> I won't, I won't. Um, for me, Chianti is, is um, a farmer's fair dish. And what I mean by that are, um, Grilled meats, cooked over an open flame. Um, <laughs> Mahesh has said fava beans, yeah. <laughs> Gr no, not fava beans, Mahesh. Grilled meats, cooked over an open flame, grilled local um, <clears throat> vegetables. So whether that be that you're having it with mushrooms in the autumn or aubergines in the summer, anything kind of grilled and slightly smoky. The other beautiful thing about Chianti's in general, but Sangiovese overall, is this incredibly high acidity and tart kind of um well how would I describe the acidity yeah it's sort of tart refreshing brisk 
Um, it can be actually a bit abrasive at times, the acidity of Sangiovese. And because of that, it's one of the only really, really lovely wines, in my opinion, that pairs with tomatoes. So all of these is um, all of these wines are for me tomato based foods. So right through to the more simple Rufina style, that could be a great pizza food. And then you start to move. Uh, we'll go on to them. But the Classico might be more of a sort of. Um, tomato sauce based pasta with some mushrooms, etc. And then as we start to get into the Brunello, we're talking Osabuco and things like that, where, you know, um, so that would be my grading of tomato based dishes with these wines. But I do think if you think it's something that you could cook outside, um, yeah, anything with tomatoes, John has just said too. I think that's very true. Um, I, I can't name a better wine that goes with tomatoes than Chianti personally. Um, but anything that cooks over an open flame as well, because it has got that sort of dried smoky herb sometimes, but a freshness of fruit that complements that. Lovely, right, let's move on um, because we talked Chianti um, as much as I think we probably can in the time. I wanna talk about Chianti forever. Um, but let's talk uh, this, oh, how could I not show you this picture? I apologize. So this is the producer, this is Frascoli. And for anyone with any uh, sort of BDI, you'll see that that is actually the label. Um, so that's the beautiful Vista from the um, 350 to 500 meter um, hills. I mean, there's, those are mountains, not hills, let's all be honest about it. But in Tuscany, they call them hills. Um, they're pretty, pretty amazing. So now we're gonna move south and we're gonna move to Chianti Classico. I've mentioned before, this is the heartland. I was tempted to put the wines the other way around to talk about where the, the region or originated and then expand. But in terms of tasting, I think that um, <clears throat> this makes more sense. So we've just talked about where it expanded to, although ironically, that is a much older estate than our next one. <laughs> um, but now we're talking about where the regional heartland was designated, Chianti Classico. The wines here have mostly been quite consistent but they were consistently less good in the 1960s. They have been pulled up uh, by their belts and braces and have been consistently improving and still staying at a very, very affordable price point, in my opinion. Mostly they're between 250, 600 metres. Again, that's the sort of range we just saw in Rufina. Um, but now with climate change, what's quite interesting is there are sites that are higher in Chianti Classico that were previously never planted. And now there are people starting to plant there and the prices of those pieces of land is going up increasingly because they want to preserve the freshness. Now, I mentioned earlier moderate alcohol levels. Chianti historically had a legal and Classico had legal requirements on minimum alcohol. They couldn't get their alcohols to 12 and a half percent. There are all sorts of stories, and I'm sure you know them, of naughty Chianti Classico and Chianti producers illegally blending in Syrah and things to bump up Sangiovese. These two wines now are 13 and a half and 14 percent. Now, some of that comes down to the techniques I was just mentioning, green harvesting to make sure you get more fruit. That will sometimes um, can can change the balance of the vine. It can make the flavor taste better, but you compromise that the alcohol goes a bit higher. The wines are still beautifully balanced, but there is no doubt that the alcohol levels have increased one percent or one and a half percent in the region. So that is why those higher sites are becoming more attractive. As the temperature rises, those alcohol levels are rising, and so they're trying to get higher up the mountain to get the altitude. Um, Chianti Classico in general is a beautiful place. This is a map drawn for somebody by us. It basically goes between Florence and Siena, and the, all of these places you can see here, and we won't have time to talk about all of them, although Castellina is, is um, where we're talking about today on our wine. Um, all of these lovely places used to essentially compete with each other for who had the best Chianti Classico um, and they were sort of boarded up like this. So we're going to be speaking about the Castellina region, but mostly you will just hear people talk about Chianti Classico or they will talk about Chianti Classico by um, quality level. Now, this is slightly more interesting because as much as it, as much as it's lovely to hear about these sites and there are completely different, um, you know, higher sites with more elegant aromatics, lower sites with kind of richness and, and backbone compared to others. Um, the thing about Chianti is there is a sort of um, 
there's sort of a quality level that comes with the aging of the wines. And often that, that tends to mean that the best grapes go into the certain different classifications. And there's also a very new thing that was introduced, and I'll tell you about that one last, the Gran Selezione. It's just finding its feet. So for me, this is quite an interesting area of Chianti. It starts to look a bit like Rioja for anybody who is um, more familiar with the uh, Rioja aging system, because we have Reserva, Gran Reserva. We start to introduce something a bit unusual. So we have Chianti Classico Anata, which is essentially a minimum of 12 months age. And these are these can be fantastic wines. This is not necessarily a quality pyramid per se, um, although it is aiming to be that it isn't because some are in the same way that you can have a brilliant uh, Reserva Rioja that is just absolutely out of this world. And um, the same can apply here. But by process of kind of natural selection, the best grapes have to go into the older aged wines. So sometimes you get you some people do buck this trend but you have the anata which is 12 months you have the chianti classico reserva which is 24 months and of those three of them also have to be in bottle and then lastly the gran selezione now gran selezione was only introduced in 2013 and it was introduced for the 2010 vintage onwards because of the nature of needing 30 months of aging it originally and i think this is where things really start to get interesting. Originally, it allowed international grape varieties, as does the whole of Chianti, not in huge quantities. I mentioned at the beginning, they need to be minimum Sangiovese for Chianti and minimum 80% Sangiovese for Classico. But what you could get in theory is a Chianti Classico, and they are common and some of them are beautiful, particularly with Merlot. Um, Brolio is a producer that's been using Merlot as, as the complement to the Sangiovese. But in theory, you could have a wine that's 80% Sangiovese and 20% Cabernet Sauvignon. And there is nothing that would indicate that on the label. Um, just it might taste delicious or it might not taste delicious, depending on how well they've done it. But what's interesting is Gran Selezione had originally allowed international varieties and was deemed to be the best sort of, we're going to be the top, uh, you know, the kind of the creme de la creme. Um, and it got a lot of backlash and said, well, why on earth, if you're being the creme de la creme, are you not focusing on the original recipe of Chianti? Um, and so they've actually removed the option to put international varieties in there. There is some movement uh, recently last year or the year before. COVID years mean my brain is fuzzled. Was it the year before? Probably. Time stood still for a while. Uh, the, the Chianti Classico producer board basically actually voted for removing the international varieties. So the shift is happening and it's been happening from the top down of that Gran Selezione. So I find that fascinating. I hope you find it relatively interesting. But the idea that they used to sell these these wines because of the Super Tuscans we'll talk about later and because people recognised Cabernet Sauvignon and didn't have a clue what Sangiovese was. And now they're saying... Chianti and Sangiovese based wines stand on their own merit and let's get rid of all the international stuff and stick to that which yeah I'm a romantic I love it um, so let's taste wine number two which is our Chianti Classico it's from a producer called Castello La Leccia so the castle of La Leccia same vintage so I thought it was an interesting side by side uh, it's perched on a hill and it's about 450 meters above the sea level so again similar heights on both of them um, the it's about a mile south of Castellena here, so it's, it's it's more southerly, so it's getting some more some more warmth to it. Sort of a slightly bigger estate, but with similar size of vines. So it's 180 hectares, but with 20 hectares vines, so similar sizes. Um, slightly younger estate. Uh, 1077 was the earliest evidence of this site. And in the in that 16th, oh, sorry, in the 16th century, it was famous for, um, I mentioned earlier, the Ricasoli family uh, who went out and searched for the ultimate viticultural practices through France and Germany. So this was their outpost. Um, this was their sort of vineyard outpost in, uh, in the uh, Castellina area. Again, very similar in the sense that it's organically farmed, no synthetic herbicides like the first. Uh, this wine is actually 100% Sangiovese, so this doesn't have the 10% of the, I think it's Canelon, I'm not sure, but it's definitely 100% this one. 
Um, and it's actually recently just been bought. So um, it was bought in 2019. So this is the last vintage of the previous owner, the Duddy family. Um, so it was a lovely opportunity to taste it. Um, in terms of winemaking, both um, the wine takes cement and oak again. So oak barrels versus cement, exactly the same as the first wine. Um, these take smaller wooden barrique barrels as well. So there's a little bit more oak influence. And I think you can, for me, I can smell that on the nose. Sorry, I forgot to change. I can smell that on the nose for me. Um, yeah, Sarah's put here oak news, used, but not very noticeable. Um, I would agree. And it's got more of a dried fruit quality. So although obviously we don't know this information, what I would say is that they also left these grapes on the vine a little bit longer than the first. Because for me, if you're comparing a side by side, this is more tart fruit. This is more dried fruit, ever so slightly. And that dried fruit for me really complements the slight extra oak, that sweet vanilla spice, sweet cooking spices. Um, it's a bit richer, it's a bit rounder. Um, it's also readier to drink. That's what I would say about this wine. Um, that, uh, that extra small barrel aging has massaged the wine a bit more. It's opened it up a little bit. Whereas the Rafina for me needs a little bit longer um, to really come to its own. Whereas this for me is just ready to drink immediately. I'm gonna have a taste and see if I can see any differences on the palate. Mm. Mm. It is richer. Um, you're tasting that sunshine for me. You're tasting, isn't it? Isn't it crazy? You're not, you know, you're not hugely further south, but you are um, in a in a more exposed site to the sunshine. You've got slightly different soils, um, not hugely, I would say, um, but you are further south. We've got some more. Um, Mediterranean influence ever so slightly compared with the Rufina. So even just that tweak, you'll also have slightly different clonal material. Um, so you can start to see how one grape variety, and I know this was 90% and this one's 100, but you can start already to see how one grape variety, even within the same region, can be so wildly different. And like I said, they haven't done that much different. Granted, smaller oak barrels, but that's really it. That really is it. And these ones had some small oak barrels. Just completely, completely different flavours. And um, Peter said the Rafina was nice, but the Classico is worth the extra pound a bottle, much more depth. I agree, it's definitely drinking now. I'd love to do this tasting. In fact, I'm quite tempted to buy two bottles and uh, do this tasting again in two years and see if the same applies. Um, the Classico is definitely already reaching a kind of really joyous um, period, whereas I think the Rufina is just a tiny touch too early. Um, but I'm glad you're enjoying it. And then Indira says the same. This one is lovely, better than the Rufina. I think they're both both great for their own merit. It's worth mentioning this one is a wine champion 2022. Um, who knows? This time next year, we might be sitting looking at wine champions 22 and Sarah might re-release the, the uh, Rufina. Who knows? But yes, they're very, very good wines for the price. And I do personally also ready for right now, think that £13.50, that's pretty exceptional so here's the estate you can also stay here as with the first wine um the uh yeah Stephen Harris has said kind of what I was what I was getting at not sure it's I'm like not sure it's a better wine but it's definitely drinking better now I think that's what you're saying Stephen if it is I wholeheartedly agree this one's ready to rock and roll this one yes he said yes <laughs> this one just needs yeah, maybe a little more development. Here's the estate though. You can stay at both of them, maybe on the same trip. <laughs> um, but they both do agriturismo. Um, and this obviously perched beautifully looking down. I don't think you can see it from this picture, but perched looking down uh, into the valley, which is amazing. So conscious of time. So what we'll do is we'll talk Brunello di Montalcino, and then I'm going to talk quickly about uh, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, and then uh, super Tuscans, and I'll try and squeeze some Vincento in there as well. Um, but Brunello di Montalcino is arguably, so we're even heading further south now, and I would say it's arguably um, probably one of Italy's greatest wines. I wish I was understating that, but I don't think I am. Uh, 
<laughs> in the 80s, it received, it was the first wine to ever receive the DOCG. So it got that guarantito at the end. Um, there are only about 200 growers. 200 sounds like a lot, but it's not. In, in the whole of Tuscany, growers are quite small. Co-ops aren't big. Um, so it's south of Chianti Classico. It's warmer. It's drier. Most of the vines, however, are even higher altitude. So most vines are about 500. Very poor soils, very low yields. All of the things that you hear again and again are really, really good for uh, viticulture. The Brunello part I mentioned earlier is the local name for San Giovese. And it is a very specific clone, the locals claim. I actually have not read the science behind that. So please don't take that as gospel truth. But it is claimed that it's a very concentrated clone. Uh, and it's to do with San Giovese Grosso, because there's two types of San Giovese. Um, and it's a very specific type of San Giovese Grosso. Uh, by law, it needs much longer, so four years aging. And Reserva actually needs five. Um, it does make, if you decide you like the style of wine, <clears throat> pardon me, it does make a, a wine called Rosso di Montalcino. And here's where we can start to understand how these wines are named. Rosso di Montalcino, the red of Montalcino, and that's a DOC. Uh, less strict on the aging. Essentially, it's like a baby Brunello. So if you decide you like this wine, grab the Rosso di Montalcinos for your Wednesday and indulge in the Brunello di Montalcinos on your Saturday. Um, they're made slightly differently. Um, many Brunellos are kind of tannic and tight in their youth. So I really was certain that I was going to taste this wine last. If you've only just poured it, members, whilst I'm just talking to you about it, swirl it. It needs a swirl. It needs a decant. Um, because they're so tight and tannic, they also um, keep much longer. So whilst you want to probably drink up your Chiantis in, in a decade, you want to keep your Brunellos a decade or longer. Um, some of the best Brunellos age for sort of 50 years. So we're drinking a Brunello young here. I actually think it's drinking really well, um, personally. But it is, uh, gosh, mental maths is failing me. It's six years old. So we are drinking it young-ish by Brunello standards. But I think Sarah's made the right choice to release it because it's beautiful now. But if you can and you have the space and the wallet, I would strongly encourage you to buy some of this and lay it down um, and, and try it in the next few years as well, because it will be amazing. Um, it's already three years older than the Chiantis we've just discussed, um, and it would need it. The Chianti, this would be unpleasant to drink or certainly a, more a bigger challenge to drink three years ago. Um, so let's have, uh, let me tell you about the wine first. That's what we'll do first. Um, so this is actually a bigger region um, or bigger estate, I should say, Val de Suga, um, 55 hectares. And it's spread throughout, um, through the best areas of Montalcino. And Montalcino is the region. So that's where I'm going to get to. Remember I said that, Brunello di Montalcino. Brunella, local name of San Giovese, di Montalcino of the Montalcino area. Um, it's got three different kind of soils that it uses, and excuse my pronunciation, but Vina del Lago, which is the clay one, Grancio, and it could be Grancio because I've only ever read it and never heard it said, but I think it's Grancio, which is kind of um, the Galle, Galestro type soil, um, and Vino Spelant, Spuntale, sorry, Spelant, Spuntale. yeah, Spuntale, which is sand, Spuntale. Um, and what they do is they blend, blend these types of soils together. So you have some clay, you have some sand, and then you have some galestro. And they blend them together to produce this wine. So it's not from a single site. The really good stuff this particular producer puts uh, in this wine, their Brunella de Montalcino. And their regular good stuff, they put in their Rosa de Montalcino. So it's a really good value option. And you find that a lot of producers will, will do this in Montalcino. Um, so you end up with some ridiculously good value Rosa de Montalcinos. Has to be 100% Sangiovese. They have been very strict in Brunello de Montalcino. Uh, so because of that, uh, this of wine obviously is that as well. It's had... Um, uh, hmm, what has it had? I'm sure I looked this up earlier when Mahesh, Mahesh might be able to remember. Oh, I know, Slovenian oak. So it's had, this is why it's different, really big 50 hectolitre Slovenian oak barrels for a much longer period of 24 months, then 12 months in concrete and then 12 months in bottle. So that's how it gets its four years. Two years, huge oak, 
then two, 12, one year concrete, and then one year bottle. Um, and what that does for me personally, in terms of flavor, is if you go back to the Chianti Classico, the Chianti Classico has that slight, sort of slightly sweetened oaks, oak note that are really beautiful and will develop with age, but always gives it that, and I don't mean this disparagingly, like a cola smell, or because uh, cola effectively is, is sugar and spice. Um, and some Chiantis like this, I get a cola smell. From the Brunello, I'm not getting that. It's much more savory. It's much more tart. Um, it's much more meaty. It's worth getting meaty. Um, I think uh, Indira's asked, would I drink, when would you drink this now or would you keep it for optimal? I think it's great to drink now. I'm certainly not putting you off drinking it now. Um, I, I would love to come back to it if I could afford to. <laughs> Um, but I don't I sadly don't have the wallet to sort of buy loads of it and taste one a year but I would encourage those who can too um Sarah's put 2029 20, again the producer might say longer we tend to be relatively conservative at the wine society um Peter Cousins has said that he's going to leave his for another four years I can understand that but I do think it's good to taste now the smells are beautiful um what you'll expect to see is some of those um because it doesn't have that very sweet oak. Instead, it's got the kind of tart fruits and more herbaceous character. What will happen is that will kind of go a bit more forest floury. Um, so it depends what you like, really. The, the main thing about aging Brunellos is they have the structure to last. Um, and these are much, much fuller wines than your Chianti. So if you haven't tasted it, give it a try. You might find you want those tannins to soften. If you want those tannins to soften, maybe you prefer a Chianti or you wait a little while for the tannins to soften. But the compromise is you're going to lose some of the fruit flavor. So it really just is, is a personal preference thing. For me, I love the aromas and flavors of this. And because I'm happy to indulge in some hearty protein based foods with be it mushrooms or, or um, a, a big hearty osobuco, then I'd be happy to have this wine now with that. It's not necessarily a great wine for 7.47 on a Tuesday night. Uh, it is a food wine. Um, oh, some people are not finding it too tannic at all. Okay, good. Um, I mean, that's that's concrete and bottle age for you as well. But um, yeah, if you are finding it a bit much, it will develop and those tannins will soften slightly. I'm going to taste it. I tasted it earlier. It was delicious. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, they're just more present. I've got a lot of acid and I've got a lot of fine grain tannins. They're not, they're very pleasant tannins, but there's certainly a lot more of them than there were in the last two wines. It's kind of richer. It's filled my mouth more densely. Um, yeah. So although it's drinking beautifully now, do feel free to keep it. It will keep. All right. I'm conscious of time. I've run over. So I'm going to whiz through the last few. But we have covered the three most important, arguably, regions. I'm going to probably go. Uh, I'll leave Vinsanto. All I'll say, it's a beautiful wine. It's um, made by drying grapes. So the grapes are dried often on straw mats. So you can hear it called straw wine or pasito wine. Um, and Trebbiano is the main grape that they often use on those sorts of wines. Um, oh, I've got to show you that, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm going to quickly talk about Vino Nibil de Montepulciano, which is actually, ironically, where a lot of good Vinsanto comes from. So the main thing to remember is Montepulciano, yes, it is a great variety, but there is no Montepulciano here. The main thing is that it's the noble wine of Montepulciano, Montepulciano, the region. And that's how you can remember it. Montepulciano de Abruzzo, which is the famous wine made from Montepulciano, means Montepulciano of Abruzzo. So the last word is always the town, mostly. Uh, and the first word is the grape variety. Uh, in this case, they just did away with the grape variety because it was the noble wines of Montepulciano. Um, so the, as a general rule, if the, the grape is coming at the beginning and the place is coming at the end. Um, this, uh, I've seen, I've got a red Vinsanto from Waitrose. Lovely. That's probably a Sangiovese, but it could be anything because Vinsanto comes from all over. Um, but if it's from Tuscany, it'll be a Sangiovese one. 
<laughs> Vino Nobile de Montepulciano, again, it's a Sangiovese based wine. A lot of people would say it's lesser quality than the majority of Chianti. And because it's that bit warmer down south, um, it's struggling a little bit more at the moment, still finding its feet. They used to over oak it, but there are really good exceptions. Um, so do look out for them. And a bit like its, its uh, neighbor, Brunello, they make a Rosso style as well. So you can get Rosso de Montepulciano for a really good value. Um, it also got DOC in 1980, um, but it's not DOCG like Brunello, its neighbor. So that is the better wine. And let's move on to um, Super Tuscans. Now, Super Tuscans are essentially uh, a, an unofficial designation, uh, and Super Tuscans actually means nothing in law. So although a lot of what is discussed is kind of unofficial and a lot of people make claims to being the starters, but most people credit the, the wine Sassicaia with the creation of the Super Tuscan movement. Essentially, in what, what happened was um, as early as the 1940s, Cabernet started to be planted on the coastal parts of Tuscany. One of the reasons is that I mentioned earlier, Sangiovese, the, the grape that shines here, likes to lie on a hillside. And naturally, the closer you get to the coast, there are less and less hillsides. So the story goes that lots of people started planting Cabernet Sauvignon because they liked it. And there's a lot of evidence of the um, Antonori family planting Cabernet and showing how well it works. And then in the 60s, um, they were sort of producing it and drinking it. Uh, in the 1970s, their house Sassicaia started to shine. In the 1980s, other Antonori family, um, it was another member of the extended family, but they started producing another wine called Enelia, Enelia um, also mainly Cabernet Sauvignon based based um, and then Masetto, which is a Merlot based from just next door. And these wines were cult wines. The reason they had to call them super Tuscans is as I've explained to you, Chianti had to be composed of 70% Sangiovese. It's actually slightly lower. I think it was 65 in the 60s, but still um, there were restrictive rules around Chianti and around the wines of Tuscany. So effectively, they just said, well, we can't do that here. It's not going to work. Um, we can't include those local white grapes. So they just planted whatever they wanted. Um, and it's very, very rare that you get success just planting whatever you want. And yet here they did. Uh, so the Super Tuscans are mainly Bordeaux blends. So you, they have some Sangiovese in them sometimes, but they focus on things like Cabernet Sauvignon, they focus on um, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot. There are also some Syrah-based wines, which are really lovely. Um, and they essentially became cult wines. They were rule breakers. They, were, they had no DOC of their own, had being the operative word. They were playing outside the rules. They had to use the IGT, which was the um, um, Indicazione uh, Geografica Tipica, so they were basically like table wines of Tuscany, but they were commanding these huge prices. And so they became incredibly popular, incredibly trendy. Um, and they were such good quality. Um, and things have changed. So Bolgheri now has its own DOC, which was essentially created to capture these quality wines. You know, um, they were running full steam ahead without any regulations in Italy. And I can not only imagine how stressful that must be for Italian regulating bodies. Um, so they created a Bulgari DOC and Sassicaia, the producer, even has its own DOC. So the Sassicaia vineyard is protected with a Sassicaia. I think it's Bulgari Sassicaia, but it might be Sassicaia Bulgari. And it's got its own DOC. Um, to my knowledge, I can only think of one other single estate DOC or geographically protected estate in the world, and that's in the Northern Rhone in Chateau Grille. Um, I actually can't think of any others. So it's a really, really special place, even if they are producing uh, wines made from French um, grape varieties, or thought to be French grape varieties, uh, and not indigenous ones. So as, a, as an aside and as a point, we tend not to buy those sorts of wines at the Wine Society. We do buy some um, blends, but we certainly don't encourage loads and loads of Super Tuscans because they're not representative. Um, I, uh, Tim said, I recall 
Tagnanello wasn't DOC. Yeah, I think you're right, Tim. Um, there were quite a few that weren't DOC that have now been swept up into things like Bulgari. Many people are actually still choosing to opt out of the DOC that's effectively been created for them. So um, there are now DOCs that permit all of these great varieties in large quantities, but because of this cult movement and this following and, and what the um, what the super, super task has achieved, a lot of producers are actually opting out, which I kind of love. I mean, doesn't really get more Italian than that. I love it. Um, but yes, going back to wine society doesn't, doesn't you know, we, we would like to celebrate indigenous grapes where we can, and we'd like to help our members explore uniqueness of place, of individuality. Um, you know, why is Chianti Chianti? Well, it's because of this. Um, but for me, Super Tuscans do still offer an incredible style of wine. They're just not a typical style of wine. They were an invention of the last 60, 70 years. That might become a classic of the future. Who knows? But um, my fear is with climate change, those great varieties are already struggling in Bordeaux. So Cabernet, Merlot, they're struggling. We might find that they're actually going to struggle also here in Tuscany. So watch this space. We'll have to see. Um, but it's certainly not something that I would, um, yeah, it's certainly not something I'm going to predict to get better and better unless they start introducing even more grape varieties, things like Grenache, um, who knows what's on the horizon, but more heat resistant and drought resistant grape varieties because it is getting much warmer. Right, I've got four minutes left. Oh, sorry, somebody at my door. I apologize. Um, there's, <laughs> I've got four minutes left, so I'm going to try and answer some questions before my dogs go completely mad. Um, so with these four minutes, let's see where we're at. We've got, da, 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 I've got a couple in the Q&A. Is that dinner? Funnily enough, it's actually the Tesco delivery man. He's early. <laughs> um, but don't worry, the husband is dealing with it. Um, so let's have a quick look. What have we got? Mahesh has kindly given me some questions. Um, oh, a comment from Chris who said, um, in his opinion, Brunello leads at least 10 years from vintage. I think that's quite a common um, a common belief, thought, um, but I certainly think that there are exceptions to the rule, and I think that um, this is, is a particularly good one. Um, Andrew's asked a good question. How does Sangiovese change in Romagna compared with Tuscany? Um, really interesting, and we haven't covered that too much, mainly because I'm keen at some point to do a um, Sangiovese mini masterclass sip size, whatever it looks like. But I think for me, Tuscany is where Sangiovese personally shines. You can find Sangiovese everywhere. So Umbria, it tends to make, in my opinion, a kind of fruity, slightly more simple style. Romagna starts to go a bit more austere. Um, I don't know if that's really the right word. Um, but a bit less giving, perhaps. Um, I think it finds its sweet spot here in Tuscany where you get that beautiful mix of, of tart but bright fruit, herbaceous notes, and then if you leave it, that really lovely classic animal. It's like the perfect trio. Um, I must say, I recently had a Sangiovese from Northern Italy made in the style of Amarone, i.e. with dried grapes. Um, I mentioned this in a tasting recently and and uh, um, a member reminded me of the name of it, Shiavar, or someone will comment, I'm sure you're far brighter than me on obscure northern Italian wines. Um, Schiavaro, Schiavaro. Um, it was the most fascinating wines. They had all the components of Sangiovese, but built like an Amarone. It was sort of 16 percent, had all the dried fruit, really, really strong, concentrated, um, a very special wine. Not something I was expecting to have tried. Um, and there was, yeah, it was very, very amazing. But you can find Sangiovese everywhere. Just for me personally, Tuscany is, is where it happens best. And if I'm really honest, Brunello di Montalcino is, is the finest place in the world for Sangiovese. Chianti Classico is snapping at the heels. Um, but because of the historic variation in the region, I think probably if you're going to hedge your bets, um, Brunello di Montalcino is where I would go. Right, um, that is probably the time, and I'm so sorry. We've got a few um, a few other questions. I uh, I hope Peter, I answered the fact that there is no there is no legal definition of a super Tuscan. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully, yeah, 
uh hopefully that's answered that question but i apologize i know that there were a few more that i didn't get a chance to to answer tonight i could have talked all night on this so i'm very very sorry <laughs> um it's great to be back doing doing sip size sessions thank you mahesh behind the scenes as always helping me out helping share links etc i'll go back through the chat because i know mahesh um looked at a couple of white wines i will send those over to you on email um, along with uh, the recording tomorrow. And if anybody does want to request those slides, just let me know. So thank you all. I hope you have a lovely evening enjoying your wines. I'm going to go put my Tesco pizza in the oven and have some of my Chianti Rufina. <laughs> Grazie mille. <laughs>